Several ladies have in of late been humanely cut and maimed by a person answering the following description. Whoever will apprehend him or give such information to Sir Sampson Wright at the office above as may be the means of his being apprehended shall immediately upon his commitment to prison receive £50 from Mr Angustine of Pall Mall and a further sum of £50 upon his conviction. Hello and welcome to today's video. So in today's video we are going to be looking at the London Monster. Between 1788 and 1790 an attacker plagued the women of London, stabbing them with a knife, pin or needle. The women reported that they had been followed by a large man who had shouted obscenities at them and then stabbed them in the bum. But the man did not always go for the women's rear end. Some of the women reported that their attacker had knives fastened to his knees, while others said that he would invite them to smell some flowers and then stab them with a pin that was hidden inside the bouquet. The attacker was never caught in the act though. He always managed to get away just before anyone could help the woman. When help came, they found the women's clothes had been cut and some had injuries. The press did what the press normally do and gave the attacker a name, the London Monster. Nobody really knew what he looked like as there were so many different descriptions. Because of this, some men founded a no monster club and wore badges to show that they were not the monster. People became obsessed with the monster. People like Sarah Sophia Banks, who collected newspaper cuttings, prints, posters and notices about the London monster attacks and stuck them all in a scrapbook. The press whipped up a frenzy by covering each attack in gory detail. They heavily hinted that the attacker must be an outsider, that is, a foreigner, and this caused outrage and hostility. The London monster proved difficult to capture. The Bow Street Runners, the law enforcement of Bow Street Magistrates Court, failed to find him which angered the Londoners. Philanthropist John Julius Angustine offered a reward of £100 for the capture of the monster, and armed vigilantes patrolled the city. Ladies started to wear copper pans over their petticoats to protect themselves from being stabbed. Satirical posters appeared across London, one saying that the monster attempted to cut up his own children and that he was going to devour all editors of newspapers, booksellers, engravers and publishers of satire prints. Descriptions of the monster varied greatly. There were different descriptions about the attacker's height, complexion and hair colour. Due to this, there were many false accusations and anyone that looked suspicious was attacked. People also speculated wildly who the monster actually was. Some people thought the, that the attacker was an insane nobleman bent on attacking the beautiful women of London, while others thought he was a supernatural being who could make himself invisible. On the 13th of June 1790, the London monster was identified. Anne Porter was walking through St James's Park with her boyfriend John Coleman when suddenly she spotted the man who had earlier attacked her. John started to follow the man and when they reached the man's home, John confronted him and accused him of insulting a lady. John then offered the man to a duel. He eventually took the man to meet Anne who fainted when she saw him. The man was Reinick Williams, a 23 year old from Wales. He was a ballet dancer but had been sacked from the theatre after he was suspected of theft. After this, Reinick worked as an artificial flower maker but by early 1790 he was unemployed. Reinick protested his innocence but due to the heightened tensions about the monster he was not believed. He did admit that he had once approached Anne but had credible alibis for other attacks. Other victims of the London monster were called to identify Reinick, but they could not identify him as their attacker. Reinick was taken to court, but the judges were unsure of what crime he should be prosecuted for. In the end, they charged him with defacing clothing. Reinick was found guilty, even though there were questions, as one of the women attacked by the London monster said that she had actually not been attacked at all and had made up the whole thing. Reinick was granted a retrial. In this new trial, his lawyer argued that Anne had made up that Reinick had attacked her so that she and her now husband John could collect the reward money. Indeed, John had just received the £100 for the monster's capture. But despite Reinick's employer testifying that he had an alibi for the attacks 
and the fact that the victim's stories contradicted each other, Reinick was convicted of three counts and sentenced to six years in Newgate Prison. Now, historians do actually question whether Reinick Williams was actually the London monster. Things at the time were getting out of hand, there were vigilante groups going around and innocent people were being attacked. So could it be that the police just wanted to pin it on someone to get all of this to stop? Because it might have seemed like that because not all of the victims' descriptions of their attacker matched Reinwick. And apparently the police had actually coached one witness to say that Reinick was the person who attacked her. Now also some historians have actually questioned whether there was a London monster at all. Was this all a case of mass hysteria? One person may have been attacked by someone or they may have made up that they had been attacked by someone and then another person might have caught on to this and said that they were also attacked and then this started to panic people. Now the main attacks did actually stop after Reinick was arrested. Was this because he was actually the London monster or was it because now that someone had been put in prison for the attacks did that mean that now the mass hysteria panic could die down? So that was the story of the London monster. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye!